Thank you all for coming to Straight Science. So Straight Science is an evening science uh, presentation series put on by University of Alaska Fairbanks Northwest Campus here in Nome and University of Alaska Fairbanks Alaska Sea Grant. And this is the home office these days. So uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples upon whose customary lands our campuses reside. So University of Alaska Fairbanks Northwest Campus and Alaska Sea Grant, we serve the Bering Strait region. And that is the homeland and waters of the Yupik, Inupiaq, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. So to begin this story tonight was you have to go back to August 12th. That is when Catherine Burchock gave us a straight science that she was, she gave us a great straight science and we felt like we were waving them off to go do a cruise immediately and unfortunately the cruise set off it was called um i actually wrote it down joining forces in the north and two different research parties so very excited to get going and get up there and since the pandemic had shut them down they hadn't been able to go they were pooling their money together and off they went and the reason you didn't hear the results is because the cruise had to turn around and go back there was some problems on board and they had to cancel that cruise. Hey. So Sekuliak was up here and some magic happened and they were able to, the, the people that were going to be on that cruise that had been on that cruise and it, it, it had the uh, unfortunate situation where it had to go back, um, they decided to give it another shot. And um, we are gonna hear Unexpectedly, they were able to pull it off and go up in November. For us in Nome to see Sekuliak in November is a great thing because everyone else has left. And we saw beautiful blue Sekuliak at the dock. She took off and went north again and then came back down. Uh, gosh, when did you guys come back down? It was late. Uh, the 16th, 17th. Right. Okay. And then we all waved her off. And that was the last northern expedition for Sekuliak. So with that, we have Seth Danielson and Jackie Grebmeyer. Seth Danielson is an associate professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. And he's, he is very well um, experienced in the Bering Strait region and in the Chukchi and Bering Seas. So I don't think he needs too big an introduction. And of course, Jackie Grebmeyer, she's with the University of, she's a professor with the University of Maryland's Center for Environmental Science. And before you start thinking Maryland, Jackie Grebmeyer is, uh, it's true. She has, that's where she goes and, and types it all up, but where she's actually working is with us in the Bering Strait region. And she's been doing it for, can I say decades, Jackie? Yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we have two, <laughs> <There's> extremely, <a> <laughs> experience, <laughs> two extremely experienced Bering Strait, Northern Bering Sea, Chuck J.C., Beaufort Sea, oceanographers. Uh, so it's a real treat tonight. With that, I guess we'll be doing questions somewhat. If you have a burning question, know that I'll be monitoring the chat box. So at, uh, put it in if you're a little bit shy. I do not see any callers on the line, but know if we do get a caller, they will have priority. Uh, it is a thing out here where not everyone in our communities can Zoom due to our infrastructure. And so if people call in, they get priority. With that, take it away, Seth. We're very excited. I, I'd ask everyone else to turn your videos off to help us with the um, cycling and, and our own uh, bandwidth challenges out here. All right, thank you. Take it away, Seth. Can't wait. All righty. Well, thanks so much, Gay, for uh, the opportunity to uh, present and uh, tell you all about what we saw out here on in the, the month of November. And it really was a, a special and fantastic opportunity to uh, come up and, and make some measurements at a time of year that we don't often get to go out and make some measurements in the Chukchi Sea region. In fact, while we were out there, I was poking away on my computer with some of the, the old data that had been collected previously because I wanted to know how our measurements were comparing to some of the prior measurements made. And I, I found in the archives a set of measurements from 1960. It's the first set of measurements in November. After 1960, there weren't any other cruises that I'm aware of in the month of November until 2011. And that was a, a cruise that Karen Astian led. 
And then since since uh, Karen's cruise in 2011, there have been a couple more that have gone north in November. Um, a couple of them did manage to sample some some stations on the shelf the way we did. They did that in pretty warm years, whereas in in our year here, um, as you'll see, there was uh, quite a bit of ice coming in. So the the conditions are 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 a little bit different than than the measurements in November from a couple of years ago. Um, and it turns out that those those measurements made back in 1960, after a little bit of digging, I traced them to a master's thesis published in 1964 by none other than Knut Agard. And so I, I wrote to Knut and asked if he happened to have a PDF of his master's thesis hanging around because I wanted to see what he said about those measurements they had made back then. And he said he didn't have it, but he was able to uh, to photocopy it. And I got it in the mail yesterday. So um, haven't read it yet, but I'm, I'm super interested to see how he interpreted all those data from, from 1960. And it's great. So that we've got these measurements from 60 years ago that we can compare to today's measurements and get a bit of a handle on how, how the system is changing. And that's, that's one of the things we're interested in, of, of course. So as we went out there, um, let's see, there we go. We were, we were heading north on this cruise, um, and there are really are four primary projects that were uh, represented out on this cruise. The Distributed Biological Observatory, this is the program that, that Jackie leads, it's an international effort, and it's, it's focused on eight different clusters of oceanographic stations, so places that we go to with a vessel to make measurements, and these eight clusters stretch from south of St. Lawrence Island up into the Beaufort Sea. And at these stations, there are measurements made through the water column of the phytoplankton, the nutrients, the physics, um, the, the zooplankton in the water column, and the, the conditions on the seafloor in the critters living on the seafloor and, uh, and in the sediment the, and the sediment itself. So these, these standard measurements are made across the, the DBO uh, uh, regions. And we were uh, lucky enough to be able to get to four of the DBO regions, DBO one south of St. Lawrence Island, two, three, and, and four. Secondly, the, the Chukchi Ecosystem Observatory, the CEO project you'll hear referred to a few times through the talk. Uh, the CEO is a set of bottom anchored moorings that we deploy on the south flank of Hannah Shoal each year. Uh, this is up in the Northeast Chukchi Sea, and this is a, a project that's led here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And our, our goal with this project is to measure as many aspects of the ecosystem as we can year round. So through all the months that we're not able to get there in ships, and uh, this is our eyes and ears on the system as, uh, 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 through through the different months of, of the year. We also have a project called Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, or AMBON. This, this program is also led out of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and its primary focus is on, on biodiversity because this is the one of the ways that we can better understand ecosystem resilience in, in the face of changing climate and how biodiversity might change. Um, and this program focuses on, on all the trophic levels from the microbes all the way up to the, the whales and everybody in between. And then finally, uh, NOAA had a couple of different uh, projects out here, one called Ecofoci, Ecosystems and Fisheries Oceanography, and NOAA's Marine Mammal Lab that's led by Catherine Birchok, who's on the line here tonight. And um, uh, these programs maintain a large number of moorings that uh, stretch across both the Bering Sea and, and the Chukchi Sea. So with that, um, I think Jackie will give us a quick overview of uh, what our plan was for this particular cruise. Thanks, Seth. Yes, as, as uh, Seth was saying, you can see the, the four DBO areas from, uh, we started up at DBO4 and we'll be showing some of the data sets and then headed South. So once we left Nome, we knew that we needed to get north before the ice pulled us, uh, moved us back south. And then you can see the transect that we went up here and we came back down. We turned some of these moorings up in the uh, C2, CL, also 
obviously the CEO that uh, Seth can mention, and C12, and then also a marine mammal uh, um, turnaround here. We went to DB0432. And the reason why the color changed here, we were not sure we could get down to southwest of St. Lawrence Island, but the weather held and we were successfully able to do that. So the, as we, as Seth has mentioned, this was to look at status and change and as a time series stations as part of the DVO and to deploy the NOAA moorings and the CEO. Uh, this is a, a consortium of cruises that go through from the summertime into the fall. And we just actually had some sharing of data at the uh, Pacific Arctic Group meeting we had earlier this week. So you can see the measurements that we have. We, we're doing temperature and salinity we do water collections with this rosette, which is uh, uh, bottles that are connected to the instruments to sense the temperature and salinity. As I said, we did mooring retrievals and replacement. In the water column, uh, we did the standard looking at nutrients, oxygen, chlorophyll A, that's the plant life that we see. But we also added the uh, measurements of eDNA, which is environmental DNA. And you can use that for tracking certain types of species in the water column. And then we looked at, uh, we did collections for harmful algal blooms. So as part of the uh, Alaska HAB network. In the water column, we did standard zooplankton abundance and biomass, the benthos, which is what I focus in on. We're looking at abundance biomass there, of macrofauna. Then we also look at this carbon content of the sediments. Uh, we look at grain size, because that's important of the type of animals that live there. And also this HAB sampling. So we collected samples in the, for the sediment where the cysts of the HABs are actually accumulating in some of these hot spots. And then they're actually, and also collected some of the animals that there being high levels of the toxins that are accumulating, particularly in the clams. And then we had the, uh, some marine mammal surveys occurring uh, from the bridge. You can see Seth's contact in some of the funding agencies. Okay, back to you, Seth. Okay, so just to give you an idea of uh, what the, the situation was like while we were out there. Here are the ice conditions at the very start of the cruise and at the end of the cruise. The start of the cruise on the left-hand side of the page, uh, you can see that over the, the, the red line is the, the track line of Sekuliak as it, as it went north. Uh, we sort of drove north directly and then occupied that line of stations going offshore in the, in the DB04 region. The, the portion of the DB04 line closest to the coast was in open water, and then we got into uh, progressively heavier ice as we worked our way offshore. Uh, and then we came back down south again. In the, um, the, the Chukchi Sea really went from something you, know, you can sort of integrate by eye, and perhaps you could say that when we started, the Chukchi Sea was maybe 40% covered by ice, and by the time we wrapped up, it was maybe uh, 60 or 70 percent covered by, by ice. So this was a really special time of year. The, the ocean was freezing up around us, and we don't often get the chance to make some measurements while, uh, while that's happening. And, and I, I think that we, we came away with some really intriguing observations, some of them, some of which might have been a little bit unexpected. Um, our, our crews had originally intended to leave on November 8th, but we were able to get the ship loaded quite efficiently that day on the 7th, and we left town about 12 hours early. And in the end, that might have made the difference between us being able to get those stations southwest of St. Lawrence Island um, or, or not, because we were really uh, fighting against uh, a clock of not only time, but there was a, a massive storm coming in during the end of, end of our, our um, effort. And if if we had been able to, um, or if we had been delayed by about 12 hours getting to that site, we probably wouldn't have been able to do that mooring work in the winds that had picked up uh, that, that final day of the cruise. So one of the, the great things about working on Sekuliak is that we have support of some very high resolution ice imagery and um, the, the navigation of the vessel is able to, to use this to help us uh, drive through ice when, when uh, we see some leads that might be uh, faster going than, uh, than just trying to, to plow through ice that's more solid. Um, and we can plan our activities so that we can most effectively make use of, of our ship time. So here we are up in the northeastern uh, portion of the Chukchi Sea, and I've, I've marked some regions that you can see are ice and other regions that you can see 
our open water. It's a little bit uh, difficult to make out at times, but you can sort of blur your eyes and, and get a sense of, of where that ice age and, and you see all these, you know, beautiful tendrils of, of ice around the edge and the different swirls that are associated with it. Um, and, you know, those, those swirls are all very interesting to us as, as I'm, a, I'm a physicist and, you know, we like to uh, try to understand what's setting these, these scales of, uh, of structure because those are influencing the, the habitat that uh, the ecosystem is living in. And um, those, those uh, different structures are uh, directly tied to the, the governing physics that are helping the system maintain it, it's char the character that it is. So here's, here are a couple of images that were spliced together from November 6th and November 7th. Uh, we were up there by the time we got there, it was, I think, uh, late on November 9th. So this picture was a couple of days old, but from this, we had expected that we'd be in ice by the time we had gotten about halfway through this DBO four line. Um, the ice had grown additionally by the time we got there, but that was about right. We, we wound up getting into the ice, I think maybe between station uh, three and station four, or maybe it was station two and station three. A couple days later, uh, we had another nice image show up, and this was the image we were working with when we crossed the, the DBO3 line. Uh, we, we were coming south on the, the track, the, the track here through some very, very thin ice, newly forming ice in this, uh, this, this dark color, if you can see where my, my cursor is. And then um, we started on that uh, DBO3 line and uh, near Point Hope and worked our way to the, to the southwest. So as we were steaming north on our, our first mooring morning, uh, this is uh, just north of, of Bering Strait, uh, very new ice in the region and the Sukuliak is able to uh, just drive through this thin ice uh, very, very easily as we're, we're heading north. And as we, we made our way north, um, you know, one of the, the beautiful things about being out there is just the, the vast variety of the types of ice that you get to see. Um, here are a number of, of individual pancakes that are starting to freeze together into more of a pack. And you can, you can see the different um, uh, regions of ice that have shifted and slid on top of one another as the, the ocean currents and the winds push them around. Uh, this is what the ice looked like when we were sort of in the middle of that DBO four line, uh, much larger uh, flows and, and more compacted and, and th this type of ice, the thickness of ice starts slowing down the uh, Sekuliak. Um, here's what it looks like when it's even a little bit more, more set up. As we were heading, yeah, go ahead. Quick question, Seth. In the chat, Rick Toman asked, is the radar sat data acquired on board Kuliak? Not directly from the satellites, but we have a, um, a, a, fairly, a, a fairly direct uh, uh, handshaking, I guess it is, between the computers so that when that satellite image is downloaded from the satellite to one of the land receiving stations, um, it can be transferred over to the Sekuliak uh, pretty quickly thereafter. Awesome. But Thank you. We, we do need to, uh, it, it's, that, that's a whole nother discussion in itself. It's beautiful, beautiful imagery, but um, we only get it sort of when, you, when we request it for a particular area. And so you have to sort of anticipate when the satellite is coming over and know when you're gonna um, be able to need uh, an image that should be saved as it's going. Thank you. Uh, you bet. And thanks for pointing that out, Gay. I can't see the chat, so do uh, do chime in there as those questions come come along. You bet. Uh, here, here's another uh, field of, of pancakes, and you, you can see that uh, they, these are not frozen together. You can see them uh, deforming pretty clearly as as the bow wake of the the ship passes through them in the in the portion of the frame that that's closer to us here. Um, and so er everywhere we were in the ice, the water was pretty much right at the freezing point, as you expect. And here's a, a map of where the ship went. And, and every time you see the color that's deep blue, 
that's water that's colder than minus one degree C or down to around 29 degrees Fahrenheit. So we spent, I don't know what it is, about uh, 20 to 30 percent of our time while we were out there um, in the ice. Some other things that are kind of interesting to see here, though, um, is the fact that it, it, it's not all a, a super cold ocean yet. I'm going to call anything more than a degree or two above the freezing point not super cold. So uh, as, as we were driving north, say, in the northeast Chukchi Sea here, we were in these temperatures that are clearly warmer than zero degrees C, more than uh, 32F, all the way up to uh, a degree and a half uh, and even more. So we're, we're a few degrees above, above the freezing point here. And um, so I think that has some implications if you're a, uh, a fish, for instance, Lyle, I don't know what, what temperatures some of these fish like to, to be in and what temperatures they can't be in. Um, but uh, here's an indication of, of what some of the habitat is doing, at least near the surface. These are waters that are drawn in uh, into the ship from about maybe four meters below the surface of, of the ocean. There, so that's the temperature. Here's what the salinity looks like. So the salinity is, it gives us a measure of how much uh, salt is in the, the water. You can see that it's the blue colors are, are there right on the western edge of Norton Sound, just outside of Nome. So these are the, the fresh, fresh waters of Norton Sound that have come out of the Yukon River and other uh, coastal rivers that have dumped into the Bering Sea. The, the salinities across much of the Chukchi Sea, though, are right around 30 plus or minus. Actually, it's, I, I think that this is sort of surprisingly fresh um, all in all, but that's, uh, that's the salinities that we're, we're seeing, uh, again, near the surface. And then once we get down into Chirikov Basin between Bering Strait and St. Lawrence Island and southwest of St. Lawrence Island, salinities are up in the range of uh, 31, 32, 32 and a half. Nitrate is one of the fundamental nutrients that the phytoplankton use. They combine nitrate with sunlight to, uh, to grow and, and make plant matter that can then be eaten by the, the zooplankton and, and ultimately winds up feeding all of the, the critters that are living in the ocean. So all, all of the, the shrimp and the worms and the, the clams, uh, the, the seals and the walrus and, and the, the whales are all feeding on matter that um, at one point was converted from sunlight and nutrients into organic matter. And, and seeing high levels of nitrate the way we are here in the Chirikov Basin region and southwest of St. Lawrence Island is not a is not a huge surprise. This is where we would sort of expect to see it. Um, but it's it's nice to have these these measurements uh, because, as I said previously, we don't get a lot of opportunity to make measurements like this uh, through the course of the year. And it, it's interesting, also uh, to me at least, to see the levels of nutrients in other places, say north of Bering Strait even through uh, the, the first four or five days of the cruise, there are many uh, hours and, and times th through this, this effort at which these levels of nitrate, though fairly low, are certainly not limiting to phytoplankton growth. So if there are enough photons from the sun coming down into the water, um, that there there's, looks like there's enough nutrients in most places to be able to support some new uh, plant growth, even this late in the season. We also had uh, Catherine Birchok on board making some observations of, of marine mammals from the bridge. She was there, I, I think, primarily to uh, recover and redeploy some of her listening instruments for the marine mammals that are mounted on the moorings that, that stay out there year round. Um, but we, and while we didn't have lots and lots of hours of daylight every day, when we did have uh, daylight and when conditions were okay, Catherine was up there on the bridge and those that you can see the faint ship track marked in, in, in gray there and everywhere there are black dots uh, 
indicate the hours that she was up on the bridge making some some observations and then when you see the the red dots with the this the blue outlines that's when she saw observations of these different species um, for instance in the upper left uh, she noted a couple of, of bowhead whales and then some some gray whales a, a, a lot of gray whales actually it looks like uh, north of bering strait in chirikov basin southwest of saint lawrence island uh, humpback whales in the same places uh, couple of individual fin whales and, and minke whales and some unidentified whales as well. Um, and Catherine, I don't know if there's anything in particular that you want to, want to say about a plot like this. She's trying to figure out how to talk to the TV, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah, we yeah, can. You're on. You're on. Yeah, Good no, I, I was I was surprised by how few bowheads I saw and how many gray whales and humpbacks there were out there. Mm. That um that Catherine, this is gay, that that matches with um local observations for sure. There is a question um in the chat. There's also a, a comment um from Lyle Britt about in response to you, Seth, where he's metabolically subarctic fishes like walleye pollock and Pacific cod tend to avoid water temps one C and below. They can survive cooler temps, but it's impact, but it impacts their ability to digest food. That's pretty interesting. Okay, thanks for that. I'm gonna, that's, uh, and, I'm gonna make a note of that. Oh, you'll get all this. And um, Opic has a question. Are you looking at salinity on different shelves? Uh, yes, so we're, um, we are taking salinity measurements everywhere we have the, um, the, the moorings and the, the salinities actually have been tracked very uh, reliably right in Bering Strait by the University of Washington's moorings. So this is Rebecca Woodgate and before her, um, Knut Agard, whose name came up previously, um, they've been maintaining moorings in Bering Strait and just north of Bering Strait. Um, uh, I think their first moorings were in about 1990 and very consistently from the late 90s onwards and they've documented from their moorings a uh, a persistent freshening of the waters uh that have been flowing north uh from the bering sea into the chukchi sea, sea through bering strait so i think this the salinity is is one of the big stories of of the bering strait region from the last few decades because um, it, it's it it is an important part of the global freshwater cycle that we can talk more about if we want to. Uh, but that uh, that salinity is is a key aspect of the, the physical environment that's out there. Um, and then some other some other observations that uh, Catherine made here uh, include walrus on the left, bearded seal in the middle, and some uh, and other or unidentified pinnipeds on the right hand side. And I think your your bottom line number was something like 2,000 walrus, a phenomenal number of walrus that was seen both on the way north and the way south. Uh, and I guess that they were in the process of their annual migration back south again with the advancing sea ice. Is that right? I guess that question is to you, Catherine. Sorry, I missed the question. Can you repeat um, it? So the, the walrus, um, were they, at this point, are they migrating back south again? Sorry, I'm in trouble with my mute. Uh, they they should be. Uh, that most of the ones we saw were just hanging out on the ice. Mm. Yeah. So they were on their way down, probably. Seth, we have walrus in the region. Okay. Can I ask, uh, Catherine? Did you see them? Were they feeding at all? Because that's a prime clam bed there. I'm just wondering because normally they're going over this area as they head north more and I just wondered if you saw any feeding bouts. Uh, no, nothing was real close to us. Um, most of the ones we saw were on, I, were just hanging out on ice. Okay. They were pretty far away. We didn't nice. see too many in the water, but it, I, I was just looking with binoculars, so um, it's possible I just missed it. And then one more, one more slide that Catherine provide some some interesting uh, individual sightings. Um, there was one large 
young dead male humpback whale that we saw northwest of Cape Lisburn, um, and not too far away, I guess, a dead floating bird. Up in the northeast Chukchi Sea, a jumping fish. And I guess we must have been in sea ice at that time, given where the, where the location of that dot is. But uh, Catherine mentioned that it was a fairly large fish jumping out of the water. And um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to see it, say about any of these sightings. No, it was definitely the fish was in ice. It was a little um, pool that was opened in the, the ice and just happened to be looking at to see if anything was there and it, it jumped out. Um, yeah. Right. Roughly how big in the length? It was at least a foot because, I mean, I was looking just with my eyes mm -hmm. um, from the Sekuliak Bridge. It was just pretty high up and I got to see it pretty clearly. Cool. Thank you. So, yeah, so Jackie, why don't you take over and talk a bit about the hydrography here? Sure. It's, thanks, Seth. Um, the, one of the nice things is that the uh, real time, the collections that are going on from the, with the uh, conductivity, temperature, depth, instrumentation, and then you can get all these sensors data. A lot of behind this, there are uh, water samples were collected for nutrients. Those are being run. We did get some real time chlorophyll. You'll see these in another slides. Uh, so you'll, but most of these are off of the sensors and the upper left is the temperature. And you're seeing on the green is that zero to one. So that's a little bit of, that's above freezing levels that uh, Seth was talking about. And that would, and then you head to the, to the left of that upper uh, left graph, and then you're getting into the ice. So this is a DBO4. You can see that in the lower left corner of the map, that's right there that Seth is showing. So we were going from the near shore, which was open water to in, into the ice, which is why you see those colder uh, temperatures. And you're seeing a vertical now uh, slice of it. On the right is the salinity. So you can see that fresher water, which is green, 30 to 31 parts per thousand. But you get that cold, that really um, saline water on the bottom at about uh, 33 uh, that, that is uh, you know, formed by ice, uh, brine, but also the tr advection of that uh, winter and summer uh, water going along the, on the bottom. The mid one on the left is the density. So that's temperature and salinity. Uh, combine there and you can see that the higher density is in that more saline water to the west and then to the right there is a beam attenuation that uh, gives you how much uh, actually light is going down into uh, the water column. Lower left is the oxygen levels, pretty high oxygen levels in that surface area uh, there and then on the right is the fluorescence and although fluorescence is an indication of the chlorophyll, it's low but there's a signature there and you're seeing that around the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 on the uh, eastern side of that transect. And again, that was the open water. And so then if we go to the next one, Seth, that's the DBO3. So now we're heading south of it. And now you can start seeing some of the differences, the upper left. You can see that uh, we were actually in some ice, that purple color is minus two. And with the warmer water of zero to one, and you can see the transect on the lower left uh, map. Uh, we went from uh, near shore uh, to offshore. You can see the salinity again, that fresh water uh, up in that area on the surface. And then the more saline water to the western part of that line that's picking up that anadir, which is usually the cold nutrient rich water masses. Lower and then the mid one, the density again, that's the, uh, you can see the higher density water with the higher salinity. Uh, beam attenuation on the, on the right, uh, pretty, uh, which means a lot, a lot of visibility, a lot of potential for light, but there was very little light that could go, that was there. Uh, oxygen levels high, up uh, 350 to 400 uh, uh, on the uh, micromoles per kilogram. And on the right, again, the fluorescence, low values overall, but interesting how you see a subsurface chlorophyll max still in November. And, uh, you know, so there is the possibility uh, if there was some uh, viability of these organisms, of these uh, phytoplankton cells, uh, if there's enough photons and there's enough nutrients. And I think at this point, it goes back to you, Seth, and then I'll talk to chlorophyll after that. Okay, sounds good. So before we leave the slide, um, I just wanted to point out that this temperature plot in the upper left, um, to me, it was really interesting. And it's, it's not at all the way I usually think about temperature in the Arctic on a, a shallow shelf. This entire line had sea ice along it. And usually when I think of sea ice being over a shallow shelf, 
I think that the whole water column normally should be completely um, unstratified. So well mixed from the top to bottom without uh, stratification. But here the, the salinity difference between the surface and the bottom is strong enough that it's maintaining stratification and we've got near freezing waters at the surface and we've got above freezing waters at the, the sea floor. And to me, that, that's, that's really interesting because if, if there are a bunch of fish that don't like super cold waters in, to, to live in, they actually have a little refugia here, at least for a while. I don't think that this probably maintains this structure through the whole winter, but they have a place to hide maybe at least for a few weeks and 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 why why we ever got a situation like this where it's it's near freezing near the surface and warm near the bottom um that that's really interesting and the only thing i can think of is that it was uh the advection the currents carrying ice over this region and so the ice got ice did not form in place but it, it must have been carried in um maybe there's other ways to think about this but uh to me this is this is really interesting and uh, yeah jackie did you have something yeah i was just gonna say if i remember correctly when we were heading north we had that evection coming from the west right isn't that what we decided that that was coming in from that direction and not necessarily being built over the site well there was that big swirl of ice that sort of came across uh from the russian waters and it looked like it was wrapping around in in into the um that basin southwest mm -hmm. of, of Point Hope. So yeah, it, it seems it seems like a reasonable uh, thing to think about. Uh, so one one of the reasons that I was that I th thought that this was interesting to look at and 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 think about um, was because as we were heading towards the DBO three line, this is the ice conditions that we found ourselves in. It was um, these these little uh, pancakes of ice and, and globs of ice that were just starting to aggregate together and form um, uh, there. You can still see waves propagating through this um, th this field in between the individual flows. There's there's a lot of ice crystals floating around in the water. And actually, a couple hours before this particular photograph, we were steaming south and I saw this in the water and I, I never thought I'd get a picture like this, but I think this is this is one of the most amazing things. Um, the, the ocean actually looks sort of like a slushy and it's uh, it's filled with all these ice crystals and you can see the sun glinting off of all the individual ice crystals and something really weird looks uh, something very weird is about the, the ocean surface here. You don't see all those little capillary waves that you normally see on the ocean, those little one to three centimeter uh, waves that, that get kicked up even in the, the lightest of, of breezes. The surface tension is being affected by all these ice crystals. And, um, and so this upper portion of the water column is, is on the verge of wanting to turn to um, pans of ice and, and pack ice, and it's, it's all starting out with these little baby ice crystals. Um, I walked around to the other side of the ship and took a, a picture into the sun, and here's what it looks on, on the other side of the ship. And again, you can see all of those granular crystals and this just really sort of silky smooth um, nature of the, the surface of the ocean at this point. So this I thought this was really really cool to be able to see the ocean just sort of freezing up right around us as as it was happening. And these um, these ice crystals, they call them frazzle ice crystals, um, presumably have some um, uh, extent through the water column, though it's unclear as to whether or not they're, say, stretching from the surface all the way down to the to the bottom, um, you know, how much of the of the ocean is really uh, turning into ice at this point. And um, Luckily, we were up there. And we we had the um, the Sekuliax, uh fish finders uh, going, and um, yeah. Just to give you a little bit of a sidebar here, um, one of the nice things about using a vessel like Sekuliak is that we've got this what's called an EK80 uh, type of, of fish finder. And um, from previous cruises that I've been on, 
we, we know that a, a, an acoustic signature that looks like this, so I've got five panels here from left to right. These are the five different frequencies of, of the fish finder from, from low frequency all the way up to high frequency on the right with these five different panels. You can see that the seafloor that's shown in red uh, sort of has the same shape between each one of those five panels. These two highest frequencies and then, then tailing off with, with the mid frequencies uh, give a, a signature that, that we know um, is often associated with zooplankton like either large uh, copepods or, or even euphausids. So some of the very um, uh, lipid rich and great food sources for, for fish uh, such as, as Arctic cod. So um, at times during the cruise, we saw some acoustic signatures that looked very much like uh, zooplankton to me. At other times of the cruise, we saw uh, signatures that, that looked like this, um, uh, which um, I'm not an acoustics expert, but uh, I did show some of these slides to somebody who is, and uh, it sounds like these types of signatures uh, look like what could be fairly large fishes in the water column. And interestingly, they seem to be really confined to the lower portion of the water column. And if this was in a location where we had near freezing waters near the surface and uh, temp water temperatures that were one or two or three degrees above the freezing point um, below that, uh, that picnic line, uh, that's, that's an interesting separation of habitat types that seems to indicate that the, the fish were really um, uh, staying in those warmer waters down below. In fact, even the zooplankton look like they might be staying below some sort of uh, layer that's delineated here. Um, and this happens to be about the, the 20 meter depth layer. Um, another type of acoustic signature that we saw at one point looks like, looks like this. And um, in, the, in the lower left-hand panel, we see what could be the signatures of maybe smaller fish. In fact, maybe you can see smaller fish in, in this middle panel as, as well. Um, these little little tick marks down at the, at the lowest frequencies, maybe these are Arctic cod. Um, but we also see this, uh, this high frequency signal that um, uh, is apparently not very biological in, in appearance. And while there could be some things like maybe jellyfish uh, that would have a signature um, like this. My, my hypothesis right now is that we were actually imaging the, the frazzle ice. So we, got, we actually got an idea of the, the depth of the frazzle ice through, through the water column. Whoops, there we go. Um, and interestingly also, it looks like there's this band. The frazzle ice is in the upper portion of the water column. And this is one of those stations where this, was take, this photograph here was taken of the screens well, we are on one of these stations that had above freezing water near the seafloor and near freezing water in the surface. And it was just a few hours after I took that picture of the frazzle ice in, in the water. And we see the, um, the, the density separation between the two layers also standing out. And um, my, my hypothesis for this is that these crystals of frazzle ice were in a fairly coastal region they were, I suspect, picking up particles of sediment, making those ice crystals a little bit heavier than they otherwise would be. And they were heavier than the water above this uh, layer that separates the two layers of the water column, but they weren't so heavy that they would sink into the, the bottom layer where the denser waters are. And so they were falling down onto this uh, picnic line. And what we have here looks to me like this layer of, um, of frazzle ice forming between the two layers of the water column. Um, so I think that that's kind of nifty. Yeah, uh, Jackie. Seth, one of the questions that comes from uh, Thomas is what is the depth scale on the fish finders and how deep does the frazzle ice go? And isn't this about a 50 meter depth? Uh, yeah, you, you can actually see here um, 49.2 meters of water for the for the this bottom set of panels, 54.6 for the middle set and 49.3. So we're in about 50 meters of water. And uh, this this separation is occurring around um, uh, maybe um, 28, close to 30 meters, but not quite 30 meters depth. Okay, and, the, and the, which of uh, the DBO lines was this? 
Or where was it? This, this per, the bottom panel was taken on DBO3. Okay. The top panel was taken on DBO4. Uh, okay. So for, the, for those of us who may not be as familiar, can, this is Gay, can you just sort of give a relative? Yeah, North, yeah. The, the, the big fish top one is a DBO4 is a Northeast Chukchi. So oh, that's that's offshore of Wainwright. Wainwright. And then the, the DBO3 is the offshore of Point Hope down over to the Dateline. That's right. And then the, the one in the middle for the zooplankton is uh, when we were steaming towards Bering Strait from the north, we were heading uh, towards the Diomedes. So um, the other two, the top one and the bottom one, when we were stopped on station taking measurements, that middle one was when we were actually uh, steaming along moving. Okay. And before you leave this one, just because I'm not showing, uh, Catherine Lalonde, who ran, who got the sediment trap from the uh, south of St. Lawrence Island one, there's a lot of sediment in those traps beyond a lot of not, a little tiny knop, a lot of zooplankton. In fact, some one inch long worms were in the bottom of uh, scale worms. So there's a lot of resuspension in the southwest of St. Lawrence. Very different uh, sediment traps than we have at the Chukchi Ecosystem Observatory. Just yeah. And um, Seth, Lyle has a question. Do you know the acoustic frequency on the left? Is it 38 kilohertz? The uh, 38 is the second from the left. 18 is the very most left one. Thank you. you bet. Hmm. And Catherine just wanted to add that although she didn't see any feeding walruses, we had feeding gray whales, humpback whales, and one minke whale. And, and note also, Catherine, in the in the Bering Strait in November, we had a, quite a from St. Lawrence Island, at least as far as Diomede and over by Cape Dejnev on the Russian side, we had a very large influx of male stellar sea lions mm -hmm. feeding as well. Thank you. And and that bottom panel, um, I believe, was only maybe one station away from where we saw that that minke whale um, and. And if these are small fish over here, it, it certainly in, suggests that there might have been something for that that whale to be chewing on. Right, and that's in the southeast check too, the DBO three. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that's our story from DBO three. Let's let's go down to DBO two, Jackie. Okay, DBO two. It's in the uh, Cherkov Basin, so between the Saint Lawrence Island and Bering Strait. So on the upper left. You would notice right away there's not the stratification that we were seeing uh, further north, and you can now see the temperatures are on the uh, eastern side of the of the transects for the uh, around zero, and then on the more western are cold, and that matches the anadir uh, on the uh, more western part of uh, the of that figure there. The salinities were around 32 to 33, which makes sense. Uh, the density is a is a combination of those. There's no attenuation. There wasn't much going on in the water column there. A lot of oxygen though. And uh, if you see on the, the right hand side, that's the fluorescence. Uh, you're still low values, but there's something in the water column spread throughout. Uh, so there's a, uh, and there, as part of the program, we were collecting phytoplankton for taxonomy. That was being uh, uh, done by Lisa Eisner. And we also collected some for our program. And then, so it's a, it would be very interesting. And we also collected uh, uh, for HAB, water column for HAB, to look at what the ph remaining phytoplankton were either in the water column and in the sediments. Okay, next. Yeah, and, and Matt Glasgow was also collecting uh, DNA right. samples. So he probably can identify what species also uh, uh, could have been there. That's right, that's right, thanks. And then the D. DBO1 uh, is the southwest to St. Lawrence Island. This is our longest time series, uh, occurred before we actually, we even developed the DBO back uh, in the uh, early 1990s uh, collection. Again, you don't really you get a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of stratification, but not much. And the where it's stratified is to the left side of that upper left graph. That's the southwest most picking up that Pacific upwelled, uh, more saline bearing seawater coming up onto the shelf. And then you see where it's it's still warm though, uh, all the way through the water column on the temperature. The salinity is more saline on the left side of that uh, graph. The upper right part has a little bit uh, less saline water as you get uh, closer to the island. Um, you can see the density differences show up similar to what you're seeing salinity because it's driven by salinity primarily. Uh, beam attenuation 
concentration pretty low. There wasn't much in the water column uh, there, but you'll see the attenu uh, you'll see a little bit more attenuation on that lower part below the 40 meters, uh, the beam attenuation, and you can see that we look at the oxygen levels. Uh, they they were a bit a little bit lower on the near the bottom waters, which is interesting. Um, higher in oxygen on the right is the fluorescence and. Although it's exaggerated in their low levels, there was something going on on the uh, near the with the Bering Sea on the southernmost part of those, and you'll see that on the vertical sections that I'll I'll show next. So even though these are low chlorophyll values, they're not vertical up and down. There is some type of a uh, uh, change in concentration in the water column. Next, okay. So now what you're looking at is just a spatial. Uh, uh, this is water column and sediment work. This was done by uh, Lee Cooper and uh, Christina Gaithel. They we did these collections real time. Very low integrated chlorophyll. If you look to the left, very small dots. If you were in there in July when we go out on our Canadian uh, cruise, it's a magnitude greater. We can get up to 800 uh, of uh, uh, milligrams per meter squared, and we did this past July. But uh, you still have something, the lower values are similar. We get that in certain parts of the area, even in July. But if you look in the Southwest, the, the area Southwest of St. Lawrence Island there, you, you see where that picked up the Southern stations actually have a bump up in that integrated chlorophyll. On the right, so what we have is low, but that small bump up, it's less than our July values as you would expect, because we have lots of nutrients and lots of light starting up uh, in the summertime. Um, on the right side is what sediment. So we look at the content of this chlorophyll because it's a food supply for animals that live in the mud. So these are the clams and the worms that the walrus would like to feed on. These are amphipods, small crustaceans, when we do the macrofauna, but that takes a while, bit of time to look at those compositions, but we're looking at abundance and biomass of that. But what you're seeing there is pretty uh, low values, but again, the signatures, Southwest of St. Lawrence Island, there's more chlorophyll getting down to the bottom there. You can see this up in the Chiricoff, north of St. Lawrence Island, the offshore sites in the, in the southeast of uh, Point Hope, and up by the DBO4 in the northeast Chukchi Sea. So there's still uh, chlorophyll. This is viable chlorophyll on the bottom that can provide uh, both food for consumption as well as for microbial and carbon cycling. So it's still going on even in, in the November although the values are about 50% less than what we have during the uh, real productive times in July. Next. So if you look at the vertical chlorophyll and what you're looking at here now is going from the left, we've got latitude on the bottom there. So you, and I've identified as DBO1, M8 is the mooring that Phyllis Stabano from NOAA has and turns around, we had a sediment trap on that. Um, DBO2 is the Cherikov Basin, DBO3 is in the Southeast Chukchi Sea, and DBO4 and the CEO in the Northeast Chukchi Sea. And the lower map, you can see, we, you can see the latitudinal gradient. And like I said, overall, the values were low, but there's still structure going on there, particularly in midwater on the DBO1 south of St. Lawrence Island. And so there were still some levels of chlorophyll midwater. And then as you go to uh, DBO, then it's low on the bottom. As you go to DBO2, there's still a little bit in the water column. DBO3, the highest levels were near the bottom uh, on, the, on that site. And then by the time you get to DBO4, this really was nothing, uh, was by comparison, it were the extremely low levels. Um, but I think it's uh, those two signatures that we're seeing on the DBO1, as well as in the um, just north of Bering Strait and DBO3 are, are, are providing some more heterogeneous structure to the system. I think, oh, and uh, Lee, Lee Cooper and, and Christina were involved in this uh, in these sampling in our team. Alrighty, and then uh, we had a number of uh, mooring operations that we did on the cruise. We wound up recovering six moorings and deploying seven. The, the temperature plot here shows the type of data that we get from these year round moorings. So, uh, 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 a temperature data logger might be recording the temperature every 15 minutes or every hour over the course of the year. And as we uh, make deployments and replace instruments on a year by year basis, we eventually build up a, an understanding of, of how the system is changing from year to year. And, and in a plot like this, you can see that the amount of time that 
the 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 near bottom temperatures are remaining say greater than zero degrees C or, or 32 Fahrenheit has been um, increasing in the more recent years relative to the the earlier years in this record where we only would spend maybe a week or two or maybe not even any time at all with waters greater than zero. So the moorings, uh, because of the, the ice keels that can extend uh, even 30 meters or 100 feet down below the surface of the water, we keep these moorings relatively short. I mean, this, this looks like a tall uh, mooring. You can see the size of a person down here as, as this mooring is getting put in, but it's about 35 or maybe 40 feet tall. And this is in a, a full water column that might be uh, 180 feet tall. So it's, it's, operate, it's, it's occupying the, uh, the, the bottom fraction of, of the water column. Uh, in contrast to the way we usually do our, our mooring operations when we're on these cruises, we just didn't have enough time uh, to wait around for daylight. And so we did almost all of our mooring operations in, in the pitch black, but it turns out that those yellow uh, floats at the top are stand out really well in the ship's uh, spotlight. So we, we drive up to where we think the, the mooring is and we, we bring it up to the surface and uh, we were able to see them all extremely well in the, in the uh, black ocean and bring them on, on board at night. And we deployed them at, at night as well. So here's a, a picture um, at the CEO site in the Northeast Chukchi Sea, and the, the sediment trap is being lowered into the water. But you can um, sort of see the sediment trap frame. There's a, a carousel of bottles. There are 24 bottles, and then there's a long tube. And over the course of the year, uh, the, the sediment in the water column, the, the sinking and uh, the sinking dead phytoplankton, the fecal pellets from the zooplankton are all uh, sinking slowly towards the feet, so, towards the sea floor where, where they will wind up as food for the, the clams. Uh, so this, this little tube uh, catches the particles that fall into it and it directs those particles into one of these cups. And then the motor will turn the, the table maybe every two weeks. And so we get a, a record over the course of the entire year of the particles that are following through the, the water column. And then Catherine will take those samples back to the lab. Um, she get, she's very happy when the, the, uh, the mooring uh, does come back on board with uh, samples. You can, you can see in this, the, the cups of the sediment trap um, are partially filled with what looks like um, mud and uh, it, it turns out that the, that's her um, her sample that she's been uh, collecting, and, and she can analyze that for the species of phytoplankton that are in the water, the the species of of zooplankton, uh, the the larvae of uh, different critters, um, the quality of the the material that's falling through the the water to the sea floor, and she can get an idea of how the the quality of that that food resource it changes for the clams and the worms that are living on the, the seafloor over the course of the year. Um, so it's a very exciting thing when we do get back a, a full year's worth of data and, we, and, and samples when you have all this um, uh, new data to, to look at. Here's an example of the type of data that we collect from the, the CEO mooring to give you just a, a feel for the, the different types of data that, that the one mooring site can uh, 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 collect. So in the upper left hand panel, this is for the year, uh, the deployment year 2015 to 2016. I show the, the ice draft, so the ice keels, uh, the amount of light that's um, making it down uh, to the, the depth of the, the sensors on the mooring, the amount of, of chlorophyll in the water column as measured by um, an electronic sensor. Here's from the sediment trap, and this is for one particular species of, of ice algae. And uh, this, this species grows uh, on the underside of ice when the sun comes back in the springtime. And then when the ice starts to melt, uh, this ice algae is, is flushed out of the ice matrix and it falls down uh, to the seafloor. And this, this represents a very strong pulse of energy to the, the, the seafloor uh, ecosystem. In the, in the springtime and the early summer. Other um, 
uh, phytoplankton that grow are diatoms, and uh, th this is one of the best food resources for the, the zooplankton that are the primary uh, food sources for the Arctic cod. Uh, on the lower right hand plot here, you can see that Catherine has distinguished the different um, stages of uh, copepods. So the, the copepods grow through their life cycles uh, from the young ones at stage C1 all the way up towards the adults at stage C5. And she can see the progression of these different stages through the course of the year. Uh, the mooring uh, also has some acoustics on it and we can distinguish the um, the appearance of uh, zooplankton and the Arctic cod that are uh, uh, showing up to feed on, on some of the zooplankton. And we can also identify through the underwater sound recordings um, the appearance of, of some critters like the, the, the bearded seals here that are showing up in the late springtime. Uh, I know that there are some walruses making uh, sounds um, during, during the summertime. So, uh, you know, this is our attempt to, to get a, a picture of the, the ecosystem from the physics uh, through the nutrients, though they're not shown right here, all the way up to the, the zooplankton, the fishes, and, and the, the marine mammals as well. So that, um, uh, that was what we were trying to do and what we were trying to uh, look at on the, the course of this cruise. I think we got a, a phenomenal amount accomplished, actually, for it being just a nine-day, 10-day uh, effort that we were able to uh, pull together at, at the last minute. We would really like to, to thank all of the the, the funding agencies that put resources into uh, making this, this cruise a success. And we thank you for your uh, attention here and be happy to um, get back into answering questions and having some discussion. All right. Well, thank you, Seth, and thank you, Jackie. And as the straight science audience kind of knows, first thing we do is Put a little love in the chat box for both speakers because it is tough on as you know, I don't know what time it is for Jackie, but she's back on the Atlantic side of things. So what time is it, Jackie? 1130. 11.30. 11.30. And she's taking the time to talk to us. Seth's talking to us from his, I hope you're at the home, not the office. No, I'm at the office. Oh, at Fairbanks. He's in Fairbanks at the office at this hour. Dedicated. These guys get gave it up for us so uh let's give them a little love you got lots of little people are getting so fancy they know how to clap and all that so yeah, it's good but everybody. comments are always nice um i know i've got lots of questions but i'm gonna i'm gonna throw it open here to either the chat or feel free to voice up your question and again thank you seth and thank you jackie honestly if you got all that done in that amount of time i hope whoever watches this with the the um, purse strings can see that maybe, you know, we need to have more fall cruises. Well, you know, um, Gay, it, it was it, it was an exhausting cruise, as they always are. It, it was it was, a, it was a whole lot of fun um, uh, being able to make these efforts. And, and, you know, we couldn't have kept up the pace of our our, um, our our work like this indefinitely with the size science party that we had. But that last push was about 60 hours that we had. Um, from the time we started our work at the bottom of the DBO1 site, the south southernmost station, to the time we finished up on the DBO2 line. And in that 60 hours, we had that a one nine hour stretch uh, where we had to drive from one station to another. Uh, but essentially, it was sort of flat out for the rest of that 60 hours. And, and we encouraged everybody to take, uh, you know, little half hour cat naps between stations because it's it's a it's absolutely a burnout um, a schedule to do that, but boy, I'm just so uh, so amazed at, at how everybody was able to pull together and help each other out in the sampling, and it was a, it was a, a phenomenal effort to get those last few stations done. Sounds like a real team effort, everybody pulling together. Very nice. All right, well, um, any questions right off the bat? You're getting lots of nice. Kudos in the comment section. So my question right off the bat is, um, so for both of you, because you don't usually go north, you know, we, we've re recently seen Seguliac go north, but what was the most unexpected thing, personally, working so far north in November? I, I think I would just say, I know Seth is gonna talk about other, but 
for me that time when I was sieving and seeing that minke whale, because I've never seen one so close. I mean, there was marine mammal life more so than I think I expected to be there in November. But that minke whale, it was like, oh, look what, look at this, this boat here. It has opened up. Now I can eat the fish. And it was just, I mean, it was like nuzzling up to the side of the vessel out all, in, in the moonlight with, yeah. with ice in the background. That that part of it, I think, it, for me, is seeing some of that and having such little light to see with that part of it. Most of it, we were working in the dark. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure the fish were going to the lights and that minky was probably like, <laughs> and probably stirring it up like you do when you take a vessel into Antarctica and sort of punch it in there and the, the animals are following it in. What about you, Seth? What was your most unexpected kind of didn't well i mean just i mean the whole beauty of the system is is phenomenal yeah. um you know seeing the ice in all of its different forms um i mean e every time i get to go out there i just think of how how lucky i am from a scientific standpoint i think um seeing that those warm waters underneath the near freezing waters was my biggest surprise and i, I thought that was pretty nifty that's my follow-up question, actually, was those warm waters. So when you mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of interest right now about um, Ledyard Bay, which is the area between Wainwright and... Uh, it, it's just north, just north of, of Cape Lisburn. Cape Lisburn, thank Cape, you. Cape Lisburn, that... an icy cape there, yeah. 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 And, um, and so, you know, seeing, hearing you say there's warm water underneath the ice at that latitude, that is interesting that it's stratified. And so my question is, are we sending it out of the Bering Street region? Norton Sound and the Bering Street region had some of the warmest bottom temperatures for the entire Bering Sea. And it looked like earlier in the year, it sort of ended where the NOAA Race Division cruise ended at Wales. And that water, they just, they just didn't get any more data because they, they couldn't go north of Wales. And so do you think that's like Alaska coastal current sort of sucking that right on up and well, uh, that's a good a good question. Um, I, 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 this isn't a trick I, question. I'm just really so, curious. So we we've been we've been looking at this some recently, and the the time it takes for uh, a little blob of water to to make its way from say Anadir Strait, which is on the west side of Saint Lawrence Island, halfway between say Saint Lawrence Island and Chukaka. There, if you took a little blob of water it would make it to the north side of Bering Strait in about two weeks. That's, it's, it's sort of water that's on kind of a fast track when it's heading up there. So we were seeing some fairly warm waters, right, in, uh, in, in, in Cherikov Basin and, and south of St. Lawrence Island. In less than a month, if water is destined to go into the Chukchi Sea, um, it can make it up there. So then the question is, how quickly is that water cooling as it's heading north? And each time it goes through one of the straits, so as it goes through Anadir Strait and it goes through Bering Strait, it's, those are extremely um, swift flows. They're extremely uh, energetic. So there's a lot of turbulence. And it's the reason why the nutrients get mixed up to the surface. So that it's the reason why we have such a wonderfully productive system here. Um, but it also exposes all that warm water to the atmosphere. And so the cooling that can take place is, is very rapid. Um, so there's a little bit of a balance between how much warm water we're sending up and how quickly it's cooling down. But it is an option to send some warm water up and have it actually uh, sort of slide underneath that sea ice. That, that could happen some. Can I ask you, when you say rapid, are you talking about weeks you could cool that water down if it's Oh yeah, vertical? yeah, you, you, can, you, can, you can lose heat very quickly. If you get some, um, some clear nights where you've got a lot of evaporative uh, or radiative cooling off the surface of the ocean, um, and especially if the winds start picking up a little, and the air temperature, those are the three things that will feed into it. But the ocean can lose heat at a rate of 800 watts per square meter, which is like having eight 100 watt light bulbs sitting on your desk, blazing heat upwards. That's it's a heat loss that's almost hard to imagine. Yeah. Right? Um, but Good that's, analogy for my brain. Thank you. <laughs> it's a. Um, <laughs> it's a really, it's a really really rapid loss of 
of heat from the ocean when the conditions are right. Okay. We need you back in November. Yeah. I mean, was it, was it better to come? I mean, you didn't plan on having this cruise this late, but in some ways, was it better or is it just sort of, I know it's shorter and you didn't get all your, all the check boxes that you would have gotten all the science that you would have gotten done in September, but. Aside from that last, last science. Yeah. It, this was phenomenal. I'd love to come back in November. I, and yeah, I'm I really, think really glad that we, we were able to do that. I'm really glad it worked out that you were too, because there's a big, there's a lot going on in this region and to have the ability to do what you did in November is just a, a phenomenal. Yeah, and I, and I think the strength of it is additive in the sense that we have cruises that went there from, you know, July, you know, from the late spring all the way up. And now for right. the comparative purposes, you can see the boom and bust of production, but the whole change in the ecosystem just by the natural versus you know, the, the seasonality and since phenology, the timing of things is changing so much. I think that comparison is going to be really informative. Yeah, really good stuff. So thank you so much. Anybody got a? This is your time to ask these two a question. Or make something up. Well, the only thing I said, somebody asked a question. I see view Academy. Are you known or an organization? What? Where are you? <laughs> Who are you? Show yourselves, I see view Academy. Look, they're shy. Yeah. Where they're, are they at? Uh, they're here in Nome. Okay. Well, that's it's great. Not, they joined. It's not in. official. Official. Okay. Yeah. Um. With sorry, with, we're here. We were taking a brownie break. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well done. Funny. They want to know what you were. They, they repeat the question. Yeah, the question was, are you an official academy? Are you an organization? People are curious at your name, IC View Academy. Uh, uh -huh. IVA. We are <laughs> yeah. So um the our the ICVU Academy, we're part of Gnome Extensions. Um, and when I need to put down our homeschool name, we live out in ICVU. Um, so the families here are part of either Gnome Extensions or the IDEA program. So Thank We're you really so much for joined. letting us join in. Yeah, well, and I'll just say you, we want to see you back on next Thursday. We're going to have the U.S. Coast Guard Tribal Liaison, though that's I'm, I'm botching it, but I don't have the poster in front of me. The Tribal Liaison for the Coast Guard for all of Alaska will be talking and specifically talking about the Bering Strait region and the U.S. Coast Guard's role and his role in communicating back and forth um, with tribes, corporations and Alaska Native organizations. So that will be really good for um, for everybody in the region. Deanna Hacker with the Gnome Nugget has a question for Seth and Jackie, and that is, for the layman, what is the takeaway from the cruise? Since there are so rare, the, the November cruises are so rare, how does the data compare to what is collected in summer or fall cruises? Good question. Yeah, I guess there, there's a bunch of different ways to, to answer that. Um, for one, our ability to, um, take some samples near these moorings that serve as calibrations for the sensors that are deployed there um, is, is, is always very valuable. And, and usually those calibration samples happen in the summertime. So that's just one example of, of the being able to be there at a different time of year and make sure that we, what we think we know, we know. You know, it's good to question yourself and and um, getting there at a different time of year when we don't have those measurements is is really valuable. Like if you had asked me, uh, would you see warm water sitting under cold water in the Chukchi Sea? I would say I would have said no, I would not expect to see that. So, you know, this was an opportunity to really shake up um, what I think I know about the system and have me you know, reassess my knowledge. I think that's super valuable. Jack, you probably have something to say too. Yeah, yeah. And for the biological point, I mean, when we go out there in the summertime, you know, we even then in July, a lot of the spring production is already settling down in the water column with a lot of, everything is stratified. You know, what we what don't see when you start building this fall uh, turnover that's happening. And so for biologically, it's more productive in the water column. 
Now they're feeding all the animals that live year round on the bottom that then feed a lot of these upper trophic animals. So that it's, it's a timing that's important. So they need that spring kickoff of production. That's changing this timing. You need this nice summertime. And then by, by moving into November, when we start getting in and sorting and looking at these animals, my excitement is gonna be, what are these animals looking like in the fall moving into winter? Because I have never sampled in November. You know, they're doing, a lot of them are putting their young in the water actually in August and, and, and September, and, but they're living throughout. And so are they, what's the quality of the food that they have and what their populations are looking like? I mean, I think I've been surprised by the, the, the sediment trap, how many zooplankton are there in that later fall period uh, because they're delayed from that really when it's ice covered, they're delayed a little later in, in the summer. So I think this looking at the seasonality is gonna be real exciting. We had a cruise in July of this year and that's usually when we go July and August. So this one really kind of spreads the range of all those measurements that we define the ecosystem system with and then we look at depend on Seth and others to tell us what the the stressor changes and, and what the temperature and salinity and things like that and what the environment these animals are in so I think that this this opportunity to do it in uh, November we we did this in October we were surprised in October to see private production going on last October uh, this time it, you know we definitely were moving into winter so it's a really nice in the last what COVID did bring is you know forced us actually to work in the fall and I think we're finding some really new novel results. So there's some, I wouldn't call it wanted on anybody, but uh, I think we, we're taking the best, we're, we're gonna find some really interesting results. So I'm gonna, there's a follow-up question for that. For the other two people who've actually asked questions, we'll go back to yours as well. But so for the follow-up to, to the question you just answered was, so does the warm water influence the ice formation or ice persistence or melting in the spring? Is the ice under a track from war air, warm air above and warm water below? Good uh, question. Yes. Good question. So the, uh, the heat will influence the ice. And if that heat can come on into contact with the bottom of the ice, then it will start melting it from below. And um, you, you might not have noticed, but up on our temperature transect of the DBO4 line, there was a station that had very cold water near the surface and very cold water at the bottom. And there was a little blip of, of warmer water in the middle of the water column. Um, that we, we've seen that type of signature before and, and there's been some work to try to understand if that type of um, intrusion of heat is enough to help delay the formation of ice in, in the fall. So um, the, the answer is, is yes, when we've got heat like sitting down there, it has the ability to influence the ice formation, especially as the ice keels start growing through the winter. They're extremely efficient at mixing the water column. And so once the ice gets beyond just these thin layers of new ice and starts um, uh, uh, moving with the ocean currents with, with some keels that dip down a bit deeper, I'm pretty sure that that warm water um, will be accessible to maybe starting to melt some of that ice. But in the wintertime, the, the cold is going to win and um, it, might, it might melt a centimeter or two off the bottom of the ice. But the, the net effect is that the ice is still going to be growing through the, through the winter. So does, hopefully that answers the question there. Does the, and if not, let me know, Deanna. Um, so we had earlier in straight science, um, Jennifer McKinnon, and she was talking about these Bering Sea heat bombs where these, these boluses kind of of warm water were being physically corralled and then shunted up into the north and sort of, you know, rolling open. Is that, would that be part of this story? Um, it's similar but different. She okay. was talking about heat that was flowing through Barrow Canyon at the end of summer that was another three or four degrees warmer than than this. But okay. yes, it's it's an input of heat to the central Arctic Ocean that she was talking about. And eventually that heat may be accessible 
to the Arctic Ocean ice pack. So it's something that we should be paying attention to um, as we're trying to figure out the balances of what's maintaining the Arctic Ocean ice. All right. So there are two questions. One is from Rick Toman. How would you expect a cruise in a warm November? Because this was a really cold November. Um, how would you expect a cruise in a warm November to be different from this one that you were just on? Well, part of it, I think, is that, you, well, you probably wouldn't have had the ice coming back as early as it did compared to what they anticipated. I mean, Bernie Coakley was out there the month before, and he said he hadn't seen as heavy of ice moving in the, can in the Canada Basin in the borderlands since 2005. So there was more ice. So if it was a warm year, that ice wouldn't be building up. It would have been later in the, probably later in November, we probably would have been able to do the CEO turnaround and so forth. So that that's something with the warming. The other thing is I think that warm water, yeah, would have kept the ice, would have kept that ice away and you might well have had more of a stratified system than we had now. Seth? Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I agree. It's the, the lack of ice and the impact that those warmer waters have on the, the biology I think of the, 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 the base biological rates that are controlled by temperature. And so when, when the waters are warmer, uh, uh, zooplankton needs to eat a little bit more to keep itself warm and do its and put on its fat reserves for the winter, for instance, um, as opposed to colder waters. So the ecosystem is operating slightly differently in cold and warm times. Right, and I, and I would just add to that too, is that you have this, you know, with the harmful algal bloom and the cis bed that's up there, it, things are coming out because it's warm. Not that it'd be in November, but it'd be the influence on some of these animal, these organisms that would then go into a dormant stage may well be delayed. Uh, if they're delayed, then they're, they're available. And uh, even in the sediments, these animals like the clams are still eating these cysts, which are toxic. So they're building them up in the body. And if it's warmer, then they're going through enhanced metabolism. So I think, you know, Seth has it right that it's going to be the zooplankton, but it, the microbial loop, the, the breakdown of some of this organic matter, it's going to extend later into the season than we have. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't take too much to do that. We just had a, a, a PhD student defend yesterday who was looking at how quickly clams breathe, right? And it, it turns out that if you change the, the bottom temperature, by just a few degrees, um, then you can you can significantly change the amount of energy that they need to to survive. And so when when our our moorings are recording changes of of bottom water temperature between minus one degree and plus four degrees, that's a that's a significant enough change that. Um, the ecosystem is probably going to have to adjust to, um, you know, just the same as, as we would if we stepped outside in, in, in zero degree weather or, or 10 below degree weather, we'll, we'll feel that difference and have to adjust a bit. Yeah, and the thing is that not only the adjustment includes one species wins over another. And we've seen this for some of the clam populations he's talking about is that some of them are like with acidification are able to tolerate that and others aren't. So there's some species are gonna be out competed and, and some species that are gonna be able to take over. So there's a whole potential to, to move a system to a different level. And we're just seeing the variance going on now with the warming at the cold. Um, we're so definitely that's part of what the modeling. So the, one of the questions, well, what do you do with this data? Well, that's the, what we're looking at the composite data and then to try to figure out what are these changes that are going on and what are the key drivers and what happens if you have that warmer November again, like we had, in, you know, 217 to 18. Yeah, a, a lot yeah, of a lot of the effort is is based on trying to understand, you know, how the system is operating now and how the system is going to change as we move forward. Um, and that was the question was from Evelyn. And I think, Evelyn, you're with, if you're still on, you're with UAF's Center for Innovation, Commercialization, and Entrepreneurship. Is that ICE, Alaska yes. Center? ICE? Yes, you are right. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. I'm actually new to the center, and I'm looking to connect with everyone, specifically everyone that is re doing this amazing research at the university. So, yeah, my question is just regarding what's going to happen next, uh, how you guys are going to leverage this data, I think. 
Seth is speaking about that right now, but I'm just curious. Thank you for your presentation yeah. and awesome work. Thanks for joining. Yeah, These guys thank did you. awesome. I mean, this is this is what we do. We try to um, we try to understand how the oceans around Alaska are are operating, and so we'll we'll take this and and um, you know I feel really lucky that we we're able to make some some adjustments to how we're thinking about the system here. There's a big giant transition, Evelyn, going on environmentally, ecologically, industrially, militarily in the Bering Strait region um, and throughout the northern and western Alaska, if that helps. So th these guys are, are um, we're so grateful that Skuliak, which is the university's um, taking care of that vessel for the Uni United, what does UNAL stand for? United National Oceanographic. University Oceanographic, please. Whatever. Yeah. University you should National know. Oceanographic <laughs> Laboratory System. Thank there you. Are. There we go. <laughs> so uh, we need to know that one. And um, um, so getting to use the vessel to get up in November, it's one of the few ice class type that can that can do work and bring researchers into the ice. So very exciting for us and very exciting times. So um, thanks again to Seth and Jackie for such an interesting presentation. Um, there's a note from OPIC. Uh, our tribe was awarded a two-year grant to continue Bering Strait king crab monitoring. Congratulations yeah. on that. I'm interested to learn about small equipment for zooplankton collection taxonomy and a couple more others. You have my email, Seth. Maybe we can talk about a partnership with collections and possibly a training with her on diamete. That, that sounds great. Let, uh, we'll be in touch, OPIC. Thank you. All right. It does sound great. Rock on. And Jackie, hats off. It's like, I think it just chimed midnight here. So um, <laughs> into a pumpkin. <laughs> yeah. And the last thing I want to say is tonight, there's a, a um, or, first off, is there any other questions? Because I think we got them all. Well, this is Rob, uh, Fish and Wildlife Hi, Service. Hi. Yes, go for uh, it. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, Jackie. So cool to, and great, Gay, you're doing such a wonderful job getting everybody connected with straight science. I was just kind of, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Seth, uh, you've said before, one degree Celsius above normal will delay freeze up by three weeks. Uh, you wanna shoot from the hip and say what you think the freeze up is or, or am I being? Uh... Well, freeze up was last week, I think. Uh... <laughs> All right, well then never mind. And Jackie, you can go to sleep. That was an easy now. one. <laughs> yeah, and Rob, know that actually there's some interesting bird, I need to talk to you at some point because there's some interesting bird observations all over Western and Northern Alaska kind of. That... Yeah, well, let's catch up. And and yeah, oh, okay. well, glad to provide you a softball answer, Seth. Or well, Rob, softball. Rob, actually, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have to hold my feet to the fire because you know my my uh, my my rule of thumb is gonna have to be adjusted now that we know that there's uh, heat below the sea sea ice. Well, yeah, that's and that that would be a follow up question. Yeah, that and you said that uh, July 2020. So now we're a little bit yeah. So you can you've got some time to think about that. Thanks. I'll, I'll ponder that. Yeah. Be careful, um, things that are recorded. <laughs> be on YouTube. So um, so for, for the Bering Strait region, um, tonight we are having, there's a, uh, for those who aren't living in the region, there is a really big low series. There's two lows. The first one is hitting tonight and there was a warning for 70 miles an hour winds at St. Lawrence Island. And it looks like from hearing from Rick Toman that they're gonna meet that um, tonight or right now, actually the gusts so know that we're forecasted in this region to be at, at, I think, gusts 45 mile an hour tonight here. So that should pick up. Know that there'll be a lull. And then um, I think we're in a, here on the Southern Sea. What the hell, Pacific where's area. my sound? I'm sorry? Hook, I think we could hear you talk, but that's okay. Um, in the Southern Seward Peninsula is in for a, right now we're in a winter weather advisory. So know that that's gonna take place Saturday night. This storm is, if, if it's coming in like that to St. Lawrence Island, know that it'll probably come on in pretty good here. So Saturday night and yeah, thanks Seth. Seth's gonna give us a, a live feed as uh, the windy.com. So that's what's happening right now. Pretty cool, thanks Seth. And um, Roll it into Saturday night. Yeah, here's here's Saturday night, Sunday morning. Yeah. Oh, yep. look at that. So Big. it's gonna be it's impressive. It's on like a 955, I think, millibar low. 
So anyway, be safe, Bering Strait region, and we'll see you next week on the 9th, and we'll have the U.S. Coast Guard talking, their tribal government officer, and he'll be talking specifically about what the U.S. Coast Guard, how they communicate and, and everything with tribes and ANO, Alaska Native Organizations and Corporations, and uh, specifically how that how that works in the Bering Strait region. So stay, thanks for doing that, Seth. That's awesome. Um, and so stay tuned for next Thursday at 6.30.